Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Diane Sawyer, president of the Reedsville Chamber of Commerce, and very excited to bring you part two of this series that we're doing with our topics at 12. Um, so we're going to get started. I know that we've got folks that are starting to tune in on Zoom. We've got folks watching us on Facebook Live. We have some folks here with us in person. Um, but we are very happy to be talking about Ayers Property today. And um, as a lot of people know, uh, this series came out of us talking about things and factors that limit people from building wealth and just a lot of organizations collaborating together to talk about what can we do to better our community. So I'm going to turn it over to DeMarcus and let him introduce himself and our speaker so thank, thank you. you thank you Diana um, so welcome everyone um, I really appreciate you all joining us in person and online uh, my name is Demarcus Andrews I am the director of outreach and engagement at CRL as well as the North Carolina policy manager um, and for the newer folks um, that are in person and online um, CRL works on credit and debt issues that impacts vulnerable and communities of color uh, and we basically work to create a financial marketplace um, that works for everyone, regardless of where you fall on the financial spectrum. Uh, and, our under, and the underbelly of this work uh, is literally to build and protect wealth uh, for marginalized communities. Part of my responsibilities at CRL is heading a statewide coalition um, where we use a variety of advocacy tools to achieve high impact reform that builds and protects wealth uh, for marginalized communities. And actually through this coalition work is where I met Merrill Holloway um, and where we partnered um, on this event series. Um, so basically what we wanted to do is sit down with community here in Reedsville um, or Rockingham County broadly just to hear about what financial issues are impacting residents here. Um, and from that conversation, our event series was born. Um, so today's topic is on Ayers property. And we have two special guests that have joined us virtually um, to provide that presentation for us. And I'll start by introducing Mavis Gregg. Uh, Mavis is self-described as death and dirt attorney and conservation professional, empowering family to use real estate as a source for intergenerational resiliency and wealth. She currently serves as the director of sustainable forestry and African-American land retention as the CEO of Air Shares. Uh, which is building groundbreaking technology to facil uh, facilitate affordable solutions for family real estate ownership. Mavis chairs the North Carolina Parks and Recreation Trust Fund Authority and previously chaired the Board of Triangle Land Conservation. Um, yeah. um, in her free time, Mavis enjoys swimming, hikes, art, and flying her Mavic Mini Drone. <laughs> um, so that is Mavis. Um, I'll now introduce Sam Cook. Um, he's made his mark um, on multiple aspects of forestry during his esteemed career. He is currently the executive director of Forest Assets and VP of the Natural Resources Foundation for the College of Natural Resources at NC State University. He coordinates the management of the forest assets on land by the state of North Carolina, the Endowment Fund of North Carolina State University, and the NC State College of Natural Resources Foundation Incorporated. In 2021, he was elected to serve as the Society of American Foresters Vice President in January 22 and moved to president in January of 2023. In previous roles at both the Center for Heirs Property Preservation, Director of Forestry, and as a private forestry consultant, he has played an integral role in developing and implementing a system of support that allows natural resource partners forests and other landowners of all income levels to increase their forest sustainability and income through sustainable forestry programs. So with that, I'll pass it over to our presenters to get started. Wonderful, thank you, DeMarcus. Um, it's great to see all of you. I am <clears throat> all the way in Florida and I love technology. I do live in Durham, North Carolina, but um, the, I happen to be in Florida today and I'm glad that I was able to join you. Um, and some of you may be wondering why a lawyer and a forester are presenting together, um, but hopefully you'll learn through this presentation that there are strong connections between the work that Sam does and the work that I do. Basically, we both work with families who have real estate and who are seeking to take care of their real estate as a, a source of intergenerational wealth. 
Sam happens to focus on forestry. Um, but I came into the forestry realm because the legal work, the legal issues I was helping families address were so complex and challenging um, that I found that giving them um, opportunities to consider ways to build wealth using their land, um, they would more easily um, navigate the issues that they were experiencing on the legal side. So Sam and I regularly speak to audiences about heirs property and the significance of heirs property and the opportunities that can help elevate your real estate as a source of intergenerational wealth. So today we are going to talk about what heirs property is and how it operates from a legal structure, as well as the challenges that heirs property owners experience. And then we'll talk about incentives and initiatives related to preserving heirs property and what you can do for heirs property, both as an heirs property owner, but also as an advocate <clears throat> and a service provider. But before I start, I would like to hear from the group, um, both online and in the room. Um, who in here has heard of Ayers Property before? So you can use the chat box, raise your hand. So there's a few folks here that are, um, are mm -hmm. familiar. And then are there any owners? Any owners of Ayers Property? Anyone own Ayers Property? No, I don't think so. Okay, well, that might change as we learn more. <laughs> um, <clears throat> all right, so heirs property simply refers to real estate that's owned by family members, each of whom have inherited their share. So anyone whose family owns real estate that was passed through inheritance owns heirs property. And there's nothing wrong with heirs property. In fact, heirs property is very important. Inheriting real estate um, is very important in, in our country. <clears throat> so we're going to talk about the different issues, the, the setup, et cetera. Um, and Sam, I'm going to ask you to help me um, in talking about the history of real estate ownership in the U.S. within the context of the African-American community um, and the, the opportunities and challenges lost Sounds good. And hopefully we can move through it enough that people will understand it because I like what you said earlier. Why would we build, build, be together speaking to our groups? <laughs> but it's interesting that you will get law school today and I will not teach you forestry, but you will learn a lot about what we do and how it relates to all families that own land or looking to buy land. So as we see back in 19, in 1865, land was pretty interesting for black people, but also minority as a whole in 1920. So when we think about, I gotta change my settings on my computer. There we go. So think about in 1920, where we own close to 20 million acres of land. And, and today that number is somewhat 9 million. And that number is a plus or minus because there's no absolute around what really dictates land ownership because it's hard to measure or track. One of the things that happened as we look at back in 1865, land was given or purchased by African-Americans primarily as a way of them owning land to act and hold for their families. Families did quite a bit on trying to retain land, but throughout history, you will find that land was taken, stolen, or ended up, they lost it in some other form. What created all that is most land were owned by white families, and we as a whole did not know what it means to own land and somewhat retain it. We understood the, per the importance of it. But our legal system back in those days did not allow us to know enough knowledge to keep the land. But most families, when I look at the single family owners, they use the land for feeding their families, uh, holding on to their homes, but also ensuring that they have a place that they can go back and call home. In the world that I deal in with minority land owners, especially Blacks, land owners don't talk about 
how much how many acres they own. They only talk about this is where I own land. They may tell you the county. And it takes a little time to get to the landowners to say how much land, where do you own it, and can we visit the land as a forester trying to work with them as a whole. You'll notice that air property will come up throughout this whole process. Land ownership, air property is another form of ownership. It may not be the best form, but you'll know throughout history that was one way that they were able to maintain and keep land. Most families that I deal with that have air property and some that are older generations holding on to the land, when you talk about, let me help you get clear title, they turn you away because they were told by their parents, grandparents, that you did not mess with the legal, with the title on the ownership of this land. And a lot has to do with when you go went back to see a lawyer during those times, Lawyers most times would go find a way to help take the land from them. And I always use this saying, as slaves, you did not want us to read and write, but you give us a deed and tell us to sign our name. Now you don't know what you're signing, so that way is that's the process of losing your land. So I look at a lot of landowners, and I'm good with the fact that how do we continue to educate, but most importantly, help them see that there's an opportunity to make your land an asset, generational wealth, and ensure that the families have something to accept. Thank you, Sam. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so this is a family tree and it's a very typical family tree, although I guess the colors are kind of bright. <laughs> but in terms of the hierarchy, the structure of it, the number of family members in it, it's pretty common. Like if we think about our own families and we think about um, perhaps our parents at the top of the tree, and then we're the first generation that, um, on that second row. Um, their third row is grandchildren. There's even some great-grandchildren. So a very typical family tree. And for today's purposes, let's imagine that the couple at the top, so the two at the very top, were a married couple who purchased 40 acres and of land in Rockingham County, and let's imagine that the second row, the circles that are black are the children that they had and the orange circles are spouses. So three of their four children got married. And then the yellow row is grandchildren and the blue row is great grandchildren. So very, very normal family. And let's imagine that um, everyone who has a tombstone in their circle is deceased. Um all of the family members with the tombstone in their circle are deceased. And let's imagine that like most families in America, none of the family members had wills. And I will say, wills also create heirs property. Um, but certainly if you don't have a will, our state laws have a law that tells us where your real estate goes. So based on your understanding of how real estate ownership passes through inheritance, and imagine in, in this family that Everyone who has a tombstone has passed away from the top to the bottom in that order. How many owners do you think we have presently? So using the chat or speaking up in the room, how many owners do you think we have presently based on your understanding of inheritance laws? DeMarcus, will you call out the um, what you hear in the room? I'm not hearing so well. Well... 12. Twelve. All right. Any other guesses? Ten. 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 Eleven. Eleven. Oh, we have fifteen in the chat. Okay. So you you're you're proving one point I want to make. Yeah. And that's that we don't agree that we have different understandings about how inheritance law works. And imagine if the eight of us or so online and those of us in the room were trying to decide where we're going to have dinner. It may take us a while to get to consensus, but I'm pretty sure eventually we will. But what if we were family members and we needed to make a decision about whether to borrow money to fix the roof or whether to allow people to hunt on the property, um, et cetera, whether to take advantage of this offer from a developer to sell our house for cash. Um, that, could be get, that could get very difficult. Now, under North Carolina law, 
um, based on the scenario that I shared, there are 16 owners. So we went from two owners with our original couple. And when the first spouse passed away, who became the owner of the property? Yeah, the, the surviving spouse. spouse. Yeah, our law, our laws favor um, when married couples own real estate, they favor that right of survivorship. That's a very specific right of married couples. However, when the surviving spouse passed away, the heirs were the four kids, and so those four kids wow. became one fourth owners of an undivided interest in the whole, which I'll talk more about in a minute. And then their share went to their heirs and so forth. So the number of owners necessarily increased over time because of how inheritance laws work. In testate succession, that's the set of laws that come into play if you do not have a plan for your assets. And who inherits depends on who survives you when you pass away and what makeup, what the makeup of your family is. So yes, in North Carolina, a spouse could inherit real estate with their late spouse's parents if there are no descendants. <laughs> um, it's a pretty funky mix. And I have to say, in looking at the laws, the inheritance laws in all 50 states plus D.C., it varies from state to state. And some of us have family land in other states. And the results, the outcomes of this, this math could be different depending on what state you're in. So what are those bundle of rights that the owners have? Well, first of all, the form of ownership the heirs property has is called tenants in common. So let's imagine that self-help or the Center for Responsible Lending, which owns quite a bit of self-help, owns quite a bit of real estate. Let's just let's say that for today, self-help decides to transfer um a building to all of us who are participating in this workshop. We're going to be co-owners of a building. We're unrelated. And the form of ownership we would have is called tenants in common. Well, the same bundle of rights applies to family members who own inherited problem, um, inherited problem, problem. <laughs> Sorry, that must be, uh, um, anyway, inherited property. So they own it as tenants in common and every owner inherits an undivided interest in the whole. That means that you don't inherit specific acreage. Instead, you own a, an interest in the whole. So every owner is entitled to use the whole. Every owner is responsible for the property, proportional to their share. Amongst the owners, amongst the co-owners, there are no survivorship rights. And what that means is that when any co-owner dies owning a share of the family property, their share goes to their heirs. And who their heirs are depends on if they have a plan or if they don't. So we don't know, typically we don't know until they die who becomes the new owners of that person's share. They also have the right as owners to transfer their individual share. So let's say that <clears throat> I co-own with all of you as family members, but I decide I don't want to own this property anymore and Mr. Developer comes over and says, hey, Mavis, I'll give you $2,000 cash for your share in this family property. I will I can do that. And I don't need everyone's um, agreement to that. However, if we're going to decide on something that impacts the whole property, then it has to be unanimous decision making. It's not majority vote. It's 100% agreement on decisions. And so thinking about your own family and your family dynamics and imagine owning real estate with your cousins and maybe some aunts and uncles, um, <laughs> you may grimace a little bit at the, the prospect of that because of how complex it can be um, based on this bundle of rights. The last um, piece of, uh, uh, last right I want to share about is the one that does often result in loss of family-owned real estate. And that's the right to seek partition. So partition is a form of physically dividing or dividing through sale real estate. So typically we're talking about partition in kind, which is the physical division of a piece of real estate. Every owner of heirs property, so every tenant in common, has the right to seek partition through the court. Of course, as uh, co-owners, we could agree to a voluntary partition. However, 
if there is no agreement, or even if I don't want to talk to my co-owners, I can simply go to the clerk of court and say, I own a share of this property. I own it with these other people. And I no longer want to be an owner. I want a partition. And the court has to consider if the part, the property can be physically divided, proportional and equitable to everyone's share. If that cannot happen, and property is very unique, <laughs> if that cannot happen, the court has to sell the property at auction. And that's the standard in every state, that the property has to be sold at auction if it cannot be physically divided, equitable to everyone's share. So partition actions are often... Um, used to target heirs property owners to acquire the whole property. Now you might ask, how does how is that so? So basically, what happens is third parties, most often third parties, will search the public records and identify real estate that's owned by heirs, understanding that as heirs, they have this specific bundle of rights and they will buy an interest or acquire an interest in the family's property and then leverage their right as a co-owner to get a partition sale. And they'll target real estate that's owned by families with multiple owners that would be difficult to physically divide so that the court will have to sell the property and the court sells it at auction. And then these third parties get it for pennies on the dollar. And that's happened to a tremendous number of families across the country, um, including in North Carolina. So what we've seen is in urban areas where there is a high real estate market, predators will leverage this type of um, strategy to obtain real estate that they can then flip. Um, I don't know if anyone's familiar with Austin, Texas, and how it's evolved, but Austin has changed greatly. And a lot of it has been done because people were able to buy family-owned land in this way. The same has happened in North Carolina, of course, and along the coast of the Gullah Geechee Corridor. Um, so this particular legal right of heirs' property makes it vulnerable to loss and, in my view, a reason why people should consider taking action to secure their heirs' property now. Um, the other issue that's most common, so the part, the threat of partition um, sale is a very common issue that we most often hear about in the context of loss of heirs property. But another issue that many heirs property owners experience that isn't necessarily connected to loss, but frustrates their ability to use it as an asset is the inability to prove ownership. So remember that family tree where we had 16 owners? Most often families come to me and they need someone to trace ownership from the last record to the present. And that's because inheritance happens automatically. As soon as the person dies, the ownership transfers by operation of law. It does not create a record of that transfer. And so oftentimes you'll have families passing ownership through inheritance, but there's no paper trail. When you don't have that paper trail, when you, you don't have confirmed ownership, and when you don't have confirmed ownership, it's very difficult to defend your ownership rights against others. Um, you have to be able to prove that you're a co-owner. It's difficult to make or impossible to make legal decisions regarding the property. So even if you think you know who the owners are, unless you have had an attorney confirm that, any decisions that are made are voidable by law. Um, up until recently, Heirs property owners could not qualify for disaster relief because the uh, proof of ownership criteria for disaster relief programs often exclude heirs property owners, not intentionally, but by operation. The same was also true for assistance through USDA. And then when you have, um, when you don't have confirmed ownership, it's difficult, if not impossible, to qualify for traditional financing. And so for many families, their real estate, whether it's agricultural land or single residence, is not managed optimally because they are stifled from a legal perspective. Oops. This map just shows us how much heirs property we think there is in North Carolina. Um, I don't know if it's big enough in the room for you to see where Rockingham County is. Um, but basically, 
we took a look at the tax rolls in um, quite a few counties to get an estimate of how much heirs property there is in North Carolina. And then this data was overlaid with um, where African-Americans live. Um, and again, you know, this idea of inheritance, I mean, our, our laws actually favor inheritance when someone dies with assets, our law favors inheritance going to families. However, our laws don't actually create mechanisms for families to be protected um, when managing those assets over generations. And so when I look at this map, I see a lot of opportunity for families to take action to secure their property so that they can keep using their property as a source of affordable housing, a source of income, a source of legacy. This map just gives you an idea of other things that happen in close proximity to where there's concentrations of heirs property. A lot of this is on the ag side, so uh, but also flooding. And remember, I said that historically, heirs property owners were not able to qualify for FEMA. We've seen whole communities um, wiped out because the families couldn't qualify for assistance to repair and rebuild because they couldn't prove ownership. Um, Sam, are you back with us? I know he had to step away for a second, so I might just take over his slide. <laughs> um, so there are, um, uh, I did say a whole lot of heavy things, um, but there are a lot of incentives to address the legal challenges. Forestry, agriculture, and other green opportunities are one example. Um, you know, I work with the American Forest Foundation um, with a program that's focused on family forest owners in the Southeast. The Southeastern United States is the wood basket of America. So lots of companies source wood um, timber from this area and rely heavily on family owned forest. Families own the highest proportion of forest in America. So family owned land is important to your Kimberly Clarks, your Ikeas, your Targets, <laughs> 3M. All of these companies rely heavily on family owned forest to supply, um, to build their wood products. And we rely on forestry for conservation clean water, um, protection of species, et cetera. Um, resident, uh, residential heirs property is also important. It's a source of affordable housing from generation to generation. So there are a lot of incentives to addressing the legal challenges, um, but I would say key among those incentives is resiliency. Resiliency, the ability to readjust and spring back after significant change. Um, and this is also community resiliency. So when there are communities that have a significant amount of heirs property in them, they too can be impaired when disaster strikes. And so there's a lot of incentives to address the legal challenges of heirs property. So let's look at solutions. Um, on the family level, uh, the solutions we want to look at are legal strategies. So um, again, a lot of times people will say, oh, they have this issue because they didn't have a will. Well, in my view, families need to think of their real estate from a business perspective. When you're thinking about a business operating over multiple generations, it's not just the uh, ownership of the business. It's also the management of the business and the activities of the business, et cetera. Families should think about their real estate in the same way. You want a plan that can endure for multiple generations and wills are very personal to the individual. So they're not enough. Instead, families should consider owning real estate in an entity, meaning that they either create a business entity or a trust that becomes the owner of the property. And then the structure of that entity, the governance informs how things are run for that family's property. For example, you can decide that majority vote is how decisions are made. You can decide who is in charge and what decisions they get to make versus what decisions the whole group should make. You get to decide who is benefiting from the property and how is the property used. So you can set up a plan that's personal to your family and to your family's land. And I will say a lot of times after folks hear me talk about using an entity uh, ownership, they want to go straight to that. But for most families, they need to first confirm who the current owners are. 
And so our starting place is actually with the family tree. So if you own heirs property or if you're working with someone who has heirs property, it's important to know whether they have confirmed from a lawyer's perspective who the current owners are. And if they haven't, then the first thing that family needs to do is build a family tree that dates from the first owner or the last record of the property to the present generation in the family. And you don't want to pay an attorney to do that, believe me. But then you go to an attorney with this robust family tree and they trace the ownership and confirm who the current owners are. Once you know who the current owners are, then the owners need to come together to make a decision. And if your family's like my family, there's always a buster in the family who can make things difficult. And so it may mean bringing in a mediator or a pastor or someone who can help hold the conversation to understand what each owner's interests are and help the family navigate so that the, they can reach a decision that leads to multiple generations of ownership. Once that occurs, once the decisions are made, of course, there's buyouts and then the property is transferred to the entity. Now, that was an oversimplification of the process, but I did want to point out that this process is in phases. And as heirs property owners, when you're engaging with an attorney, it's important for you to understand what phase are you at (laughs) because you don't want to commit to spending a lot of money on legal fees and there's no no milestones. My suggestion is first answer the question, do you do you have confirmation from an attorney who the current owners are? If the answer is no, do you have a family tree? No, then you need to build one. And that's your starting point. We can talk about that more in the Q&A if anyone has questions. <clears throat> there are also solutions that we've seen on the policy side. So the first Uh, one that I want to talk about is state level law. So remember earlier, we talked about the ability to partition, um, use the court system to seek a partition. Well, about 21 jurisdictions, 21, um, 20 states and, or 18 states, maybe 19 states in DC and Puerto Rico. Oh, actually USBI. So 21 jurisdictions have adopted the Uniform Partition of Heirs Property Act. So basically, whenever there's a partition action involving heirs' property, they the court has to get a fair market value appraisal of the property. Then the owner who is seeking the partition has to offer their share to the other owners to purchase. So the other owners, the non the non petitioning owners, get the right to buy out the owner who's seeking the partition. And then if that is not achieved. The prop and the property has to be sold. The property has to be sold on the open market. So no auction, which is very important because at a minimum, it's offsetting the the loss that the family will experience when that property is sold. Because when a property is sold through a court partition action, not only are you selling under market most often, but then you have to pay for all of the court proceedings and then the family gets to divide the proceeds. So it can really wipe out that source of intergenerational wealth very quickly. The Uniform Partition of Heirs Property Act provides some additional measures that can help increase the chance that more money is realized than when it's done through an auction. Now, on the federal level, we've seen Farm Bill 2018, where for the first time in the Farm Bill history, provisions are provided for for um, heirs property owners to obtain a farm and track number. And if you're a farmer, you know that a farm and track number is essentially the social security number for your property. Historically, heirs property owners could not get that based on the proof of ownership criteria. Now there's criteria specifically in the farm bill that says in states that have adopted the legis- the Uniform Partition of Heirs Property Act, this is the eligibility criteria. In states that have not adopted this legislation, this is the eligibility criteria. North Carolina is one of those states that have not yet adopted it. So if you're involved in policy at all, speak to your politician about the importance of the Uniform Partition of Heirs Property Act. It did pass the House last year. It did not make the Senate. But it is legislation that could also help Um, North Carolina farmers obtain access to USDA services more easily. Again, in states that don't have the legislation, you can still get it. It's just harder 
the criteria is a bit more harder to overcome. They also created a loan program in which qualified um, CDFIs, community development financial institutions, can loan money to heirs property owners to resolve legal issues and to do buyouts. Personally, I hope that that changes in the next farm bill um, to some form of grant. Um, I don't think people should borrow money to solve legal issues, <laughs> even though I am a lawyer and appreciate getting paid. Um, it, I don't think people should finance that and, and for, further burden the property. FEMA also expanded its proof of ownership criteria to uh, be more inclusive of heirs property owners. I do think that the criteria is still very difficult to meet. And so I think anyone who's living in an area that's prone to natural disasters, should any effort you can make on the front end and getting that paperwork together before disaster strikes is a good look. Because when it does, I think it's much harder to get, get documentation, et cetera. Um, and then on the innovation side, we've seen substantial progress um, in support of heirs, property owners, and landowners who have unique challenges anyway. And so to that end, I'll, have, I'll pass it to Sam to talk about um, initiatives that we've seen supportive, including the work that you've done with the SFLR program and the fish, you have fish, uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife. U U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service? <laughs> <laughs> So who's ready to take the bar exam? <laughs> you didn't sell them on that, Mavis? No. Nah. Okay. So I think you've heard quite a bit about air property, land ownership, land utilization. Uh, what we found, and this is sort of the history of my career, that landowners, especially minorities, they own land for the health of keeping their families going, but they did not see it as a financial opportunity for them to pass it on to the next generation, nor did the kids see it as that opportunity. 2012, the U.S. Endowment for Foresters and Communities, which is a large endowment that was able to receive money from the federal government for a Southern Lumber Agreement tariff, that decided that we want to launch a program to see if there's organizations in communities that would be able to help landowners see that there's an opportunity in owning land, but also making income off the land. Uh, the targeted areas in Mavis lead, lead, leads this process now, and we don't, I won't spend any time talking about them, but we started in South Carolina as part of my career with them in 2013. The project itself was landed to ensure that we recruit X number of landowners, offer them an opportunity for education and research, resources to see what would it take for them to in, increase their income potential, look at all the organizations out here who does work in this space that can help them that's already free from the taxpayers but most importantly focus on what are the programs available that provides funds to them and those programs entered around usda the natural resource conservation services the forest service uh, even some of the other organizations such as land trusts that have money that supports good conservation on the ground projects that i deal with today still focuses in that same space. But my most recent program that I brought in and helped Mavis help me facilitate this, that was started back in 2018, 2019. It was something that the U.S. Forest Service, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, that's under the Department of Interior, decided how do we look at our individual people that's in the field, do more work with minority landowners and around the, sort, around the actual programs that they have to offer. We created an educational series, which includes part of what we're doing today under Mavis leadership. We have a landowner component that says, here's how the history of land was moved throughout generation and what happened during those time periods. One of our colleagues out of DC who lives in Belize uh, under the group called In the Four. And we had a bias training that was done by a New York colleague. All of this was to help them see what they need to do to learn how to talk to people in the communities, learn learn what it means to educate them on the processes that's going on, but focus on not just the programs, to listen to people and what their needs are. A lot came out of that because it led to us doing field visits, working in two different states, Mississippi and South Carolina. That was an in-person meeting that brought landowner to the table for them to learn what we taught the 
individual leaders of Fish and Wildlife and their field staff, but also to talk back to those individuals to say, here's what we see, what we're missing, and what you are not doing for us. And they, some of them express the things that they're already involved in, especially since the project of SFLR is on the table. They were able to talk to them, i.e. in the South Carolina region, about here's what USDA does for us. Here's how people that we work with work with us. And that led to a lot of opportunities for our landowners. And so we're about to launch this program again, either in Texas or one other southern state, probably in the next three months, and get them centered around the work that's going on in South Carolina and Mississippi. I know Mavis probably spent some time talking to you about the law schools, but more importantly, here are some groups that we've been doing some work with, Dot Vermont and Wake Forest, but I'll let her tell, tell you a little bit about that work as a whole. Yeah, Wake Forest Law School has launched an heirs property clinic, so it is in its first year. I don't think they're taking on client matters yet, but that's the plan for them to offer legal services to heirs property owners. Um, And then Vermont Law School has a farmland toolkit. So it's a website. Um, If you Google Vermont Law School farmland toolkit, um, it has a ton of information for agricultural landowners um, including um, information specifically about heirs property. And there's a New North Carolina heirs property fact sheet that I authored that gives you some of the information that we talked about today, as well as some strategies you can apply in navigating um, issues with your heirs property. Oops. Um, Sam mentioned the Sustainable Forestry and African American Land Retention Project. Roanoke Electric, which is in the northeastern part of North Carolina, is the North Carolina partner working with family forest owners. In fact, they started out working with African-American family forest owners, but then they opened it up to their whole membership. Um, And now they've expanded. I think they're in 14 counties total. I don't recall if Rockingham is one of the counties, but they are in 14 counties in North Carolina working with anyone who has forests yeah, Rockingham so, is not one of the counties. Oh, it's not? Okay. No. Most of the counties are on the eastern side of 95. Oh, okay. Yeah. So what can you do for heirs property owners, whether you own heirs property or not? I think it's important to appreciate the history and contributions of family-owned land as heirs property. Again, our laws, our state laws, create heirs property Um, by providing this right of inheritance to family members. So there's nothing wrong with heirs property. What is wrong is our legal system doesn't support it. And so it's important for us to understand that and appreciate the significance of family-owned land in our area. Um, And then consider what you or your organization can do. This could be for your own family land. Um, Some people feel overwhelmed thinking about their own family land and their family dynamics but maybe it's just starting with your own interest and how that's going to be dealt with. And maybe it's um, helping other family members understand some of what you've learned today through education. Um, And then I think partnership. Uh, We've seen a lot of unique partnerships over the last several years of organizations that care about family-owned land for different reasons. For example, in North Carolina, the coalition that is seeking passage of the Uniform Partition of Heirs Property Act is a mixture of the Audubon Society, which cares about birds, the Conservation Trust of North Carolina, which cares about other species and and water, um, the Black Family Land Trust, um, a few private practice attorneys, etc. So there are a lot of people who care about this issue and partnerships have been tremendous in terms of transforming um, the state of things for heirs property owners and quite frankly families that have challenges Mm -hmm. with their real estate. Um, Create an asset map. I'll show you in a minute what an asset map is. And then of course funding. Um, Legal services are very uh, expensive. Um, That's just that's just America. Um, But many families um, exhaust their funds for legal services very quickly just to prove ownership of the property and often don't have enough funding to get a real good succession plan. And so funding is also needed for heirs property owners. 
Um, here's an asset map. So an asset map is a visual inventory of the resources available for a particular purpose. So you all could consider creating a heirs property um, resources in Rockingham County asset map. And in that you would list the organizations and entities applicable um, under these categories. For example, lawyers, who are the lawyers who are qualified and of high integrity <laughs> to work on heirs property matters. And that includes, you know, presenting about estate planning, succession planning and managing family property. Who are the appraisers, mediators, realtors, surveyors, genealogists, and conservation groups, and even drone companies? What are the government agencies that can provide support? And this could be your um, um, farm service agency office or your soil and water district, et cetera. And then of course, other institutions, Sam and I have found that working with churches and other faith-based organizations has given us access to more, more landowners who have shared values around um, taking care of the family and taking care of earth. Um, and then of course, there's always the land. What are the qualities of the land? Um, many people have great ideas about what they want to do with their property, but it doesn't often, it doesn't always align with what's possible, what's possible with their property. And so educating people about the qualities of land in, in your area could be another aspect of the asset map. All right. Uh, so maybe it's what I did find is mm -hmm. I took the asset map for granted until we actually started the program back in with the center. And as mm -hmm. we launch off other programs, especially other projects that we work on, this is a good source for you as individuals living in communities that want to build out any type program, center yourself around what's important for the people in the community to learn and try to identify the resources and the individual networks that's out there that's helping to do that work, whether there's a cost or it's free. This way, you don't have to spend time building out something when this gives you a tool to start the process. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And with that, um, I think we can open up for questions for Q&A. Yeah, thanks, Mavis and Sam and, um, and everyone. If you, I hope you all weren't trying to take all the notes, but these slides will be shared out um, afterwards. Um, just please leave your uh, email on the check-in and um, I'll get them to you. But yeah, we'll open up the floor now for your questions. I do have a question in the chat. Um, so Tanya right. Hooper says, my dad and his siblings own several acres of land and some family decided to pay taxes on that line, on that land before, oops, what did I say? before they could, and now they say they own that land. Is this true? Um, <clears throat> great question. It's very common um, with heirs property where you'll have family members who pay the property taxes and family members who don't pay, and for various reasons. Uh, in this scenario, it sounds like someone was trying to get ahead of others and paying the property yeah. taxes. And the um, the answer to your question is no. Um, paying property taxes on behalf of another owner does not increase your ownership interest in the property. It doesn't change your ownership in the pro interest in the property. Instead, um, the person who is paying on behalf of another has what we call a lien on the interest of the non-paying co-owner, meaning that if any income came into the property, um, the non-paying person's interest um, share in those proceeds would be discounted by what they owe the person who paid the property taxes on their behalf. Now, okay. they could be pursuing what we call um, adverse possession, which is a, a type of legal action in which you are saying, I own this and I own it as my own against anyone else who claims that they own it. And in North Carolina, they would have to, as a, if they're related co-owners, they would have to maintain possession and control exclusive of the other owners for a period of seven years. And paying the property taxes is one activity, but it's not definitive of them um, exercising adverse possession. Meaning that if if the other owners <laughs> were aware that they own this property and they were too, they were also trying to take care of it and, and steward it, 
just because the other person paid the property taxes doesn't mean that they um, are getting it through adverse possession. Okay, that answered my question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I see another question. Oh, no, that's some information on ways to reduce your property tax. Thanks, Sam. Did you want to talk about that? Well, I added several things. I think it's a good takeaway for whomever is taking notes or sharing with the rest of the group. But copy and paste the Sustainable Forestry African-American Land Retention Network link, along with the SFLR that speaks to a video that was done back for the Center for Areas Property Preservation that explains how the network works. Uh, land seven, five acres or less could be cost qualified for present use value, which means you have a strong, I think it's 10 acres though. Uh, you reduce your taxes tremendously along with for forestry land is 20 acres or less, uh, 20 acres or more. So read what I sent to you. If you think you qualify, feel free to reach out to us and we can help you get in touch with the right person to give you the right advice to help you take advantage of that good tax saving. It's not a small set of dollars. It's a lot of money that you save. Oh, yeah, I see that again. What? Sorry, I just realized. So Merrill and I, um, Merrill and I know each other from college and Beth Glenn, who also was with the black with us in college, I see that she's on the call. So I was just saying. So, so, so you got some followers, huh? Reunion. <laughs> it's a reunion. <laughs> what other questions or comments do folks have? So um this I, I was asked, I don't own air property. I have a lifetime right to this property. A uh, long story of how we got there. It evolved from an aunt who um, received the land from my grandmother because everybody trusted her to do the right thing. And, and she did, and she doled it out, and you know everybody got the place she wanted them to have. But then she didn't trust us not to sell it. So we all have a lifetime right. So there are six sets of cousins with 10 acres each uh, who have this. And some, actually, there's one group that, there are four of them that share the 10 acres. But anyway, so my children will inherit this once, you know, their name is to, they're supposed to get it when something happens to me. What happens if I decide I want to just sign over my lifetime right to them? Is that doable? So that they could then sell the property if they choose to do so. What an interesting strategy. So, <laughs> oh yes, <laughs> this was our life. We loved her, but yes, uh, she she got that worked out really well. And as a lawyer, I have to say it. Did, my answer depends <laughs> without having the benefit of reviewing the documents. But um, so there's, a, if, if I understand this correctly, there's a deed to you um, for a, for your for your life, and when you die, it goes to your children. And it names him explicitly. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so That's I a good one. I pay taxes every year and I get $300 for soybeans every year. And that's it. And then I pay my cousin 200 to take care of the property for mowing and such. So, so <laughs> there we are. It's a good bottle. <laughs> good what? Good what? So I think the way to remedy, I mean, I don't, I don't know what other, what all the deed says. Um, and I know people try to control, you can only control so far, but I think the remedy would be that you and all of your kids, all your kids are adults. 23 and 26. Yeah. That all of your kids and you, whoever is named as the remainder men mm -hmm. and you as a life estate would sign a deed from yourselves to, I guess, is it the two kids? Oh, it froze. Okay. Did I freeze? Yep. So, yes, I, have. Yeah, I think the remedy would be that all three of you or however many remainder men in you would sign a deed to whoever it would go to. So like, it would be the three of you to your two kids. It's two kids. Okay. 
Yeah. And, um, and what I'm experiencing at least twice a week, we get a letter. Oh, I understand you're interested in selling your property on such and such. Well, we haven't been interested. And the amount that they're offering is laughable. It's about half the tax value. And I can just imagine these folks who have, you know, a huge family who own all this property and somebody says, oh, they're going to give me X amount of money, how they can come in so easily. So easily. Property. Yeah. I mean, and I, I get the strategy. I get the rationale behind splitting up the property. It's meant to be a conflict resolution strategy. Okay. However, from a, an economic perspective, it actually diminishes the value. And so I think your family you and your family members that own the neighboring lots that were part of the whole should consider a cooperative agreement in which you're working cooperatively to do some larger activity. Sam, could you speak more on that? Um, you know, for Yeah, I think what one of the things I suggest to multiple landowners, especially if it's in close proximity or adjoining, is spend some time coming together and talking through the objectives for each one of you as a landowner and coming up with a master plan as it relates to either forestry or agricultural. And with that, the economy of scale will help you long-term generate more money versus what you're doing from a 10-acre perspective. And I always tell people it's easier to uh, divide money versus dividing the land. So with you already having the ownership, the only thing I would suggest is coming together as a family that's willing to sit down and talk through the strategy for a long-term approach, whether it's a forest management plan, plan or a land use plan. Yeah. And I have to say with family land, we have to get creative and think out the box and how we approach things. And this could be a great opportunity for the younger generation of your family, the, the future owners, <laughs> those life estate, uh, the ones that the, the remainder men, this could be a great opportunity for them to, um, to work with the the current generation on a um, you know a pitch, you know they could maybe, maybe could have like a family reunion or, or Shark Tank like activity where the younger generation is going out and doing some due diligence and pitching some activities that y'all could do together as a family. Understanding that folks will maintain the ownership of their ten acres, but that you're gonna operate cooperatively to achieve some some bigger goal. I think that's a great way to. One, get the younger generation engaged and interested in what else can happen besides selling the property. And then two, it's giving you the um, experience of working together and demonstrating to each other that you can work together, you know, even though auntie has already physically divided the property for, for you know, conflict's sake, you still could work together to, you know, build the, use it as an intergenerational wealth, an intergenerational asset for, for the whole family. That it's was also a good tool to, to educate a younger generation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that would be a great goal. And, and I, I would like to think that we could achieve that. Mm -hmm. We'll see. Thank you for that suggestion. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I, I had a quick comment, real quick. And it's, uh, Pastor Moore, if you don't mind me sharing a little bit about the work you're doing in Stoneville, but maybe you said something about like one of the difficulties, like after figuring out the family tree, is like, if there's the the buster in the family that's like being difficult is using trusted community partners or pastors, faith based organizations right. to to uh, to support that. And so out in Stoneville, North Carolina, Pastor Morgan's on this call has created a, a CDC um, that and that that is working in, in combination with the uh, with the church that's close to this building that they purchased. And it got access to several acres. But there's also other acres of land that are heirs property where they're having that challenge. And I'm starting to think, like, would it be a really good strategy to if uh, if faith based organizations and clergy were educated about, you know, the basics of heirs property and served as that, you know, mediation space? Absolutely. I think um, at least I mean, Sam, I, I please chime in, but I've I've found that. Um, people are are very responsive when it's in the context of their their faith. Um, that they think about what their um, values are and 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 the community, the faith community that they're in, what the values are. Um, so I think, and I think that 
you know, pastors serve multiple roles, including counselor, including dispute resolution provider. Um, and, mm-hmm. and I will say as someone whose career started in mediation, it's my dream to see um, heirs, property owners and um, other leaders in communities become mediators for families that have heirs property disputes. So if y'all want to scheme up something, I know the right folks to develop the training. I'm just listening to this. There's so many that need to hear this presentation today. Um, the ten, uh, there's 10 acres right behind my church that nobody will probably ever do anything with it if they don't come together. They've tried to, but uh, the air airs are spread out so far. Some no longer live in this area, but their names are, you know, attached to it because of being an heir. Yeah, I uh, promote uh, faith-based organizations to really become part of trying to accomplish. Because when we started the program back in 2012, 2013, my first outlet was getting into the communities, finding the churches to help us come in and educate on what we're trying to accomplish and talk to their landowners. And I had a message for the pastors, always looking to increase funds coming into the church. How do you help landowners increase wealth off their land, which should come back to more increased funding into the church? I didn't succeed, but I think there's a lot more people now listening to that model. Uh, and so I encourage you to think about it from mediation, think about it from an educator. You have a container of people that listen and respect you. Help us get into those places so we can help them grow wealth in their families as a whole and not lose the land. Thanks, Sam. Any last minute questions? <laughs> so like say if it's uh, building um uh, house or something. Would the decision have to be made within all the heirs to do that? Like uh, within them, like if one person is to add a building, they all have to come in. Or how mm-hmm. does that work? I'm just curious. No, you wouldn't. Um, you What's the question? So like if one of the heirs wants to build something um, on that land, they have to come in agreements with uh, with everybody else to do that. Yeah, so n- n- construction on land that's owned by multiple folks. Correct. You have to get permission of all the other owners. <laughs> so I laugh because I will say in practice, that's not what happens exactly. I think families have informal agreements, but it, it, yeah. th- if that happens, understand that when you build a home, a, a, found, a home on a foundation on the property, um, uh, absent some sort of contract agreement between you and the other owners, that that home, that building belongs to all the heirs. Now, I distinguish that from a mobile home because mobile homes are treated as personal property unless they're legally affixed, which is a, you have to take actions to do that. But if you build a home on a foundation on heirs' property, you don't own that home. <laughs> <laughs> You don't own it. <laughs> but maybe it's a quick question around that with the mobile home. So it's not treated like the house built, stick built house. Mm-hmm. Would they be required to move it if someone says, I don't agree with it being there? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah. You still need permission. You still need permission. <laughs> it's yeah. very common for families with heirs property to have multiple dwellings on the property. And it can get challenging, you know, depending on how folks are getting along or not getting along. But from a legal perspective, you need all the owner's um, agreement. So that's why, again, having a a ownership structure that supports decision making and management can help address some some of these issues. I also wonder, um, and I just haven't had the capacity to explore this, but I wonder how disaster relief works when we're talking about a single parcel with multiple dwellings that have been damaged. You know, can each of those dwellings apply for individual assistance? There needs to be, you know, we have to take, unfortunately, we have to take additional measures to ensure our heirs property can participate in these programs. 
Mabel, thanks, Mabel. Yeah. Uh, so we've come to, yeah. Awesome. yeah, 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 definitely cut it up. Thank you. Yeah. All right, everyone. So we've come to the end of our time together. Um, I do want to thank Mavis and Sam for your helpful information, um, explaining what heirs property is and why it's so important for us to protect our land um, and our property. Um, so I hope you all um, enjoyed the conversation. Thank you all for engaging in it, helpful questions. Um, but yeah, we have our next event on February 28th. This one will be around student debt. So specifically what CRL is doing within the state to protect borrowers from student loan services. And we'll also have a college advisor come in and kind of prep juniors and seniors um, for financing secondary schooling. Um, so I appreciate you all being here and I hope to see you soon. All right, bye Mavis and Sam. Thanks guys. Bye y'all. Thank